Hello, friends. Welcome back to ABN's Trinity Channel for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. Today is Monday, February 5th in the year of our Lord, 2018. It's a blessing as usual to have you here joining me for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. And if you are not seeing this on the internet, it's probably because you're watching it through satellite, or you might perhaps, perhaps be watching it on your Android or Apple device, or Amazon Fire Stick TV, Apple TV, Roku, the list goes on and on. If you want to know many different ways that you can watch this show and all of the shows, all the live shows every single week, go to trinitychannel.com forward slash platforms. You'll see many different ways uh, by which you can watch these shows live. Also, the first International Apologetics Marathon of 2018 is happening June 4th through 8th. So hopefully uh, you are tuned in for that and you help spread the word about that as well. We're going to have a whole week's worth of great guests and great topics as usual. But today uh, I am blessed to have with me a man who was here just about a year ago. He was actually here February 6th. 2017. If you didn't get to see the show with him, go to the Trini Channel's YouTube channel or my Vimeo channel, vimeo.com forward slash Tony Grillet, and you'll be able to see a show that we did called Stealth Invasion. And this was based on his book, Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. This is what the book looks like, but we also probably hopefully have a picture to show you on your screen there as well. This is a book that you want to get. What is happening with a whole refugee situation and all of that? Leo Homan is my guest today. He is back to give us an update on this stealth invasion. This is called the Trump factor. Obviously, some uh, different things are happening today than they were about a year ago, and that's a, that's a good thing. But Leo Homan is an author and investigative journalist. His new website, save this to your favorites, leohoman.com. And he is a veteran investigative reporter and author whose recent book, again, Stealth Invasion, spent the majority of 2017 among Amazon's top 10 books about immigration policy. He has spent decades researching and writing about education, immigration, crime, politics, and religion. His articles have appeared at WND.com. Front Page Magazine, Whistleblower Magazine, Jihad Watch, The Drudge Report, Refugee Resettlement Watch, and many other websites and publications. Holman has been interviewed by dozens of local and national radio hosts, including Laura Ingram, Alex Jones, Daniel Horowitz, Larry Elder, George Norrie of Coast to Coast, and Jan Markell of Olive Tree Ministries. His mission has always been to fearlessly report truths about the great issues of our time and connect the dots wherever they may lead. Leo, it's great to see you again, and it's great to have you back to give an update on this stealth invasion. Yes, thank you, Tony. Thank you for having me on the show again. I know we've got a lot of ground to cover, and as you said, my goodness, we could not be in a much different uh, position today than we were one year ago. It's interesting how this worked out, how, again, uh, just about a year ago is exactly when you were here. This stealth, this invasion, w whether it's stealth or not, is still going on. And it's a, a, a huge difference, though, because now uh, there's, there's a monkey wrench kind of thrown into this mix. And uh, Obama is out of office and Trump is in office. So just off the top of your head, I mean, what are the uh, major differences here or what monkey wrenches have been thrown into this stealth invasion, which unfortunately is still taking place, even though many people yeah. don't realize it or haven't even been studying this at all? Yeah, uh, it is still taking place. You're right. But the main difference is in terms of the numbers. Uh, President Obama in his last year in office was bringing in 110,000 uh, refugees, uh, more than half of which, or right about half of which, were coming from Muslim Sharia-compliant countries that hate America. Um, the year before that, I believe it was 80 or 85,000, and the years before that were right around 70,000. So. And there were a few years in his first term where they were really down into the around 55,000 range. So you could say that he averaged roughly 70, 75,000 per year uh, refugees coming into the United States. Uh, and as you know, they, they are resettled in cities and towns across America by nine 
uh, contractors, government contractors, many of them with church-sounding names like Catholic Charities, Lutheran Social Services, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, World Relief, which is an arm, as you know, of, of the National Association of Evangelicals. Uh, there's these nine agencies that get paid per head for every refugee that they bring into the United States. And they often bring them to uh, cities of all sizes, uh, large, small, medium size, without those cities, even in some cases knowing how many or where they're coming from. It truly is amazing how this program works. Uh, but the numbers, as I said, roughly 75,000 a year under President Obama. Uh, the first year, full year, uh, is fiscal 2018 under President Trump. He set the ceiling which is the maximum number that we could bring in at 45,000 for fiscal 2018. But at the rate they are coming in, Tony, we would be lucky to hit uh, 15 or 20,000. So even though he set the ceiling at about half, about half of what President Obama was bringing in, it doesn't look like we're even going to reach the, that uh, cap by the end of the year. So it looks like maybe 15 or 20,000 will be coming in. And I do think that he's trying to make a little bit more of a concerted effort to bring in more Christian refugees as opposed to that 50-50 mix uh, where 50 were coming from Muslim countries and 50% were coming from all different other faiths. So the largest single faith that was coming in under President Obama was Islamic. Uh, I think the Trump administration is trying to put a little bit more emphasis on Christian refugees. As you know, there's <laughs> plenty of those to choose from as Christianity continues to be the most persecuted faith on the planet Earth. Uh, if you look at the Open Doors annual survey, uh, it is just, you know, it is truly uh, astonishing at how little is reported in the mainstream media about these Christian brothers and sisters who are being, you know, beheaded, raped, crucified, kidnapped, intimidated in countries from, you know, Pakistan to Egypt to Syria, uh, Iraq, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, you know, almost across the board. Uh, you know, eight, and nine out of the ten top ten worst countries for Christians, I believe, were uh, Muslim majority countries. With North Leo, Korea a, being the the exception. Yeah, yeah, de definitely. Uh, North Korea is, seems to be number one there constantly, and of course Trump has talked about North Korea a little bit lately, or more than a little bit. Um, a follow-up question, Leo, to what you just said. I know in your book, uh, just in the first chapter alone, you talk about how many Christians used to be in the Middle East before um, the um, Armenian genocide. How many Christians, Chaldean Christians, um, used to be in Iraq before Saddam fell, and how when these uh, these men, whether they're dictators or not, they're taken out of power, and then you have the the group with the weapons, the the group who is the strongest who rise up. Of course, we've seen that become ISIS, Al Qaeda, ISIS, uh, etc. Just different jihadist groups. They have killed so many Christians. They've driven out so many Christians. Now, do you think, uh, and just for my audience here, do you think that the number of Christians, refugees, Christian refugees who are coming to the West is so low because there are just so fewer Christians in those areas to begin with because they've been killed by Muslims or jihadists or whatever? Or do you think that there are many Christians still there overall, even though less than before, but they're just being completely weeded out of the refugee uh, transfer process? I would say the latter. Uh, there, there are still a lot of Christians uh, who are hiding out, you know, fending for their lives, hiding in churches, hiding in homes. But the thing about it, Tony, is very few uh, Christian refugees actually go to the United Nations refugee camps. Uh, they're set up in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, and these places. But if, if you're a Christian and go to these refugee uh, camps run by the UN, you are likely to, make, to meet a fate that could be as bad or worse than the place that you are fleeing from. Uh, sad to say, the UN has done a very poor job of protecting Christians in these UN camps. 
Many of them are managed by Muslims. Uh, there are Muslims in many of the uh, positions of authority in these camps, and they just uh, turn a blind eye to the attacks on Christian refugees. They they're being they've been raped, they've been uh, beaten, they have been uh, killed in some cases, and so word spread rather quickly around 2014 when the mass exodus out of Syria and Iraq. Well, Iraq had started before that, but uh, around 2014 out of Syria, uh, 2013, 2014, word sp started spreading really quickly that if you're a Christian, do not go to these UN camps because you will meet, in some cases, a deadly fate. And so uh, they really have not shown up at these camps, and therefore they're not being dispersed into the West uh, like in the numbers that perhaps we should be seeing. Uh, the United States, uh, what people like myself have been pushing for is for the United States, England, Australia, to uh, uh, unilaterally try to relocate some of these Christian refugees, but we just have not seen that in any numbers to really speak of. Uh, in fact, under Obama, uh, even the few refugees that were coming uh, out of Syria uh, uh, into the camps, Christian refugees were not ending up in the Western countries. It was like 98% Muslim coming from Syria uh, throughout the Obama administration. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little of both in, in the scenario you painted, but I think mostly the latter. Leo, every single Friday, just about, on, on Islam in the News, I am reporting news stories from around the world, many from Europe, things that are happening because of the refugees who are there, who, like, if you, like you mentioned all the time in your book, are not trying to assimilate in any way. Um, and, and I continually remind the audience about this, what seems to be an ultimate bait and switch here, because it was just, what, a, a couple of years ago that the story about that young boy who washed up on the beach in uh, uh, off of Turkey uh, and Robert Spencer just totally blew holes in that story saying, hey, things don't line up here. And it was because of that situation that everybody started saying, hey, these refugees need to go someplace. And rather than children or women and children or families, for the most part, showing up in different countries, if you look at the pictures, it's like all men, they're all like military age. And I guess many people either don't realize this or are not uh, bringing it up and saying, hey, wh why is this happening? Why aren't we seeing families? Why are we seeing military aged, pretty much 90% men, it seems like, and very small percentage of Christians, maybe half of 1%, and at the same time, thousands and thousands of people coming. We're looking to Europe. Uh, I keep telling people, look to Europe. You either need to learn from their mistakes, we're going to follow in their footsteps, one of the two. And every single week I'm reporting uh, news stories about what's happening because of the refugees who are there. Um, this is an information war. And what do you see as the ultimate enemy here? Uh, being waged against Western, civiliz Western civilization? Yeah, that's a good question, Tony. Uh, to me, the ultimate uh, enemy is the, the United Nations globalist agenda, uh, which was put forth in the uh, 2030 d uh, sustainability document uh, a couple of years ago. It was ratified uh, by President Obama and 150 some other countries worldwide. And, it, and that document really sets forth uh, for the first time the rights of migrants, so to speak. And these rights supersede, these international rights supersede uh, national sovereignty in many cases. The, the document talks about the rights of third world migrants to come to more uh, wealthy countries in the West and demand all sorts of rights. They have the right to affordable health care. They have the right to affordable housing. They have the right to not only come here, but the right to all these freebies, affordable transportation, you know, uh, uh, good paying jobs. Uh, you know, what about the rights of Americans? Uh, this we have been uh, sort of shuffled to the end of the line when it comes to the UN, and what it really is is a global plan for re massive, massive redistribution of wealth. 
And that is the ultimate enemy, is the globalists who are pushing the UN plan, uh, Tony. And uh, but Islam throw, you know, globalists and Islamists. It's sort of a dual edge. Uh, sword there, but I really see Islam as sort of more of the method of our destruction as opposed to the uh, ultimate uh, ultimate uh, end of where we're going. I, I don't think these globalists are going to allow in the end their children, their daughters to uh, be wa- to be forced to put on you know hijabs and and live a life of submission to Islam. I just can't see that happening, but. Uh, they do plan to use Islam to, uh, uh, as a sort of battering ram, as I describe it in my book, to bring down the middle class, bring down this last vestige of independent living, so to speak, which is the middle class in America. We're an independent lot. We don't look to the government. Uh, we're hardworking. We don't look for handouts from the government. Uh, we like the government to sort of be out of our lives as much as possible. Well, this is not the UN global agenda. The, the agenda is a, a socialist global governance uh, situation where uh, everybody is dependent in one way or another for their living uh, on the government and uh, is also subjected to 24-7 surveillance. And and what is one of the best ways to do that is to instill fear in the population, fear of Islam, fear of, of terrorism. And, and as we saw with 9-11, uh, the American people are willing to give up some of their rights uh, uh, and more rights with each new terrorist attack. And this is quite unfortunate that people aren't looking to Europe and, again, learning from their mistakes. They're, they have very low percentage of Muslims, if you look at the overall population, and people say all the time, oh, you know, the percentage of Muslims in America are very, very small. Well, it's technically quite small in Europe. And if you're talking maybe 5%, that's not a whole lot. But as we've seen in the life of Muhammad and throughout Islamic expansion uh, since um, he lived, he existed, the same thing. As, As they grow in numbers, they continue to demand more things. They get more aggressive. They speak out more, and all of that. We're already seeing that kind of that kind of stuff happen in different parts of the United States. But yet, of course, here in the U.S., we have the Constitution, we have the Bill of Rights, which of course are being attacked all the time, uh, not just by the groups who support this, but by just leftists in general. Uh, I mean, we're being hit from all angles here, <laughs> really. And yeah. um, if if people don't speak up about this problem and we don't have an open and honest national debate, then what will the ultimate price be? The ultimate price will be our freedom, and, and the First Amendment will be the first thing to go. The Second Amendment will be the second thing to go. Uh, you know, all we have to do, as you said, is look to Europe. First, it's socialized then it's Islamized. And while, you know, the, the uh, Muslim population may only be five or six percent, uh, I think it's seven or eight percent in France, uh, this is still fairly low, as you said. In, in America, it's about two percent at most. Uh, but the reason, the reason we see all this happening and we, we see this Islamization going on with, with very few Muslims relative to non-Muslims in these Western countries is because of who they are allied with. Uh, the, the Islamists, uh, and when I say Islamists, I'm not speaking about your you know, everyday average Muslim. I'm talking about Muslim Brotherhood funded and organized organizations that, s- that claim to speak for all Muslims when they really probably don't. But they have the power of speaking for all Muslims because our government leaders have given them that that power in Europe and in the United States. So when you have this uh, uh, Muslim uh, organization that claims to speak for the Muslim, all Muslims in your country, and then you have the left aligning itself with that uh, coalition, that is a very powerful block. You speak. You think of the money and organizational capabilities when you pair the Muslim Brotherhood and its organizational ability and all of its money with the uh, globalist, secularist, leftists uh, of the George Soros ilk. Uh, that is a uh, force to be reckoned with <laughs> in all of these countries, and that is why we're seeing the Islamic agenda being pushed in the media being pushed uh, at, in our educational system, 
being pushed down our throats in terms of the law enforcement uh, agencies, both FBI and local law enforcement, state and local law, law enforcement. Uh, you know, they are completely infiltrated by uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in 2011, the FBI agreed to uh, cleanse all of its training manuals of all references to Islam that were considered offensive to these uh, Muslim Brotherhood affiliated organizations like CARE and ISNA and ICNA and MPAC. And, you know, they go on forever. There's dozens and dozens of them. And uh, 50 of them in all sent a letter in 2011 to then National Security uh, <coughs> Advisor John Brennan. And he uh, acquiesced. And Rob Robert Mueller, who was the FBI director at the time, acquiesced. And they all purged their training manuals of everything offensive to Muslims. So now, uh, you know, you have just unbelievably idiotic things being taught to law enforcement. Uh, you know, I did a story last week. It's on my website about uh, the FBI bridges program. They have quarterly meetings in many cities uh uh, in which they, it's called, you know, bridging the gap or some, I don't remember what, it's an acronym, bridges, but it's basically sensitivity training and being more culturally sensitive to uh, the various immigrant groups. And Islam always seems to be top among the Im Im immigrant groups that they're concerned about pacifying and making sure that they're not offended. You know, the, the women, you know, who are arrested, uh, don't want to take their hijabs off and, you know, they'll file a lawsuit. Just crazy stuff like this uh, that we're seeing going on in law enforcement. We're seeing the same thing going on in uh, at the university level. Uh, university of Kansas, for instance, has a separate cafeteria for female Muslims uh, where they don't have to take off their burqas because that's just women in there. And, you know, because eating your lunch in public with a burqa on could be rather uncomfortable. You have to try to force the food up under the burqa and it can be messy and whatnot. And so there's a separate cafeteria now for female Muslims at University of Kansas where uh, it's only uh, women allowed and they can eat without their burqa on. You know, it's just, as I say in my book, it's not just equal rights that we're seeing being given to the Muslim population. It's, uh, it's, it's special rights and privileges to the point where uh, we have uh, Muslim uh, residents of our country, many of them who are not even full citizens. They may be here on a green card or a work permit, but they're actually what I call super citizens because they have more rights than we do. I mean, could you imagine a Catholic or, or some other faith going into the University of Kansas and demanding a special uh, cafeteria or a special prayer room? that we've seen pop up in many of the universities and even high schools now are opening Islamic prayer rooms and Islamic washrooms. It, it's, it's truly astonishing the special rights that are being handed out like candy to these folks. Uh, so no, they're not assimilating because we don't ask them to assimilate. In fact, we uh, encourage them to file lawsuits against us. Well, yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> this, is, this is so backwards in every way. If they're coming here, they should be getting the instruction manual on how to assimilate, how to fit into Western society. But that's, that's not the case. If military goes to a Middle East country, what are they told? That, because you're in their country, that is when you have to be culturally sensitive and all of that. That at least makes sense, right? But if they're right. coming here, it should be the exact opposite. They should be the ones who are told, hey, this is what life is like in America. These are the freedoms that you have in America. Hey, you don't like it. Well, then go back. But America is not going to change for you. And as you had said, we do want to make a distinction here between your average Muslim neighbor, coworker, friend, classmate, etc., and your Islamist or Islamist, who also is not a jihadist, but have the same end goal of the wanting the world under Sharia. Many of your individual Muslims, they just want to live their lives and all of that. But at the same, at the same time, the, the Islamists will use the average, moderate, uh, cultural, nominal Muslim for their end. They will look to them Absolutely. as being the Ummah, 
And guess what happens if they speak up? Well, what happens if they speak up in countries that are under Sharia? Well, then they're considered hypocrites. Uh, here, this is the time for Muslims to leave Islam because it's false. Uh, you know, not being trying to follow Muhammad's life to a T, who's considered the perfect man and the perfect Muslim and all of that. But this is so completely backwards and people need to realize what is going on. People need to realize, hey, the jihadists are really just a distraction from what's happening behind the scenes. When we come back, we're gonna have a lot more questions for Leo Homan. Again, check out his website, leohoman.com. Go and buy his book today, Stealth Invasion. Again, it's been out for about a year now. It's been on the top seller list. Go and get a copy. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. There are many ways that you can watch ABN Sat TV ministry. You can download the ABN Sat app on any Android or Apple device and stream it live on the go. The ABN Sat app is also on select smart TV brands such as Sharp and Samsung and can be streamed using the Chromecast in-app feature. The app is also available on Amazon Fire TV if you enable one click on your Amazon account and search ABN Sat. For Roku and Roku devices, just type ABN Sat into the search bar, or if you just want English shows, type Trinity Channel. And for Apple TV Generations 4 and up, type ABN Sat into the search bar. ABN Set is also available on satellite, Galaxy 19 to North America, Optus D2 to Australia and New Zealand, and now set to the Middle East. Some select Trinity Channel shows do air live on these satellites. The ABN Set app is also available free on our websites at abnsat.com and trinitychannel.com. You can also watch our programs live on YouTube and Facebook. To view our list of platforms again, visit our website at trinitychannel.com slash platforms. Trinity Channel is now airing live 24-7 on our YouTube channel. Apologetics, debates, and discipling are now constantly streaming for all of our YouTube viewers. Be sure to comment on, like, and share our stream to support Trinity Channel's efforts to disciple all nations. Watch live on YouTube today. As it is ABN's mission to go and make disciples of all nations, our discipleship program has spread to several different languages. Reach out to them. He wants you to break up of every division. Any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We started out with these languages, but coming soon are even more. Stay tuned to see these programs come to ABN. ABN and Trinity Channel produce over 12 live shows each week to equip Christians and expose darkness throughout the world. On Monday, watch Colliding Worldviews with Tony Gurule at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Trinity Channel. At 7 p.m., watch Truth Matters with Rafa Christie's staff on the Trinity Channel as well. Tuesday, War Without Weapons is back with Dr. Waffle Sultan, once a month at 1.30 p.m. on ABN. The Cross and the Crescent with Pastor Joseph will be airing at 6.30 p.m. on both Trinity Channel and ABN. On Wednesday, The Way of the Holy with Brother Fadi, a prayer show at 11.30 a.m. will be airing on ABN. At 1 p.m., U.S. and the Bible Answers with Brother Ishmael will be airing on ABN. At 8 p.m., The Power of the Kingdom with Brother Safa, a prayer show, will be airing on ABN. Focus on Iraq with Kamal Yeldu, a political show, will be airing at 1 p.m. on ABN. 
Thursday, we will have They Have Deceived You with Sister Noel at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on ABM. And on Friday, The Grace and Trio with Dr. Basim Goriel will be airing at 12 p.m. with special guests on ABM. Islam in the News with Tony Gurule will be airing at 5.30 p.m. on both Trinity Channel and ABN. And our last show is Inherit with Christ with Brothers Buchan, Steve, and Lon at 7.30 p.m. on ABN. Watch these shows live on ABN and the Trinity Channel each week. Hello, friends. Welcome back to ABN's training channel for another episode of Colliding Worldviews. My guest today is Leo Holman, author and investigative journalist. Again, his book is Stealth Invasion, Muslim Conquest Through Immigration and Resettlement Jihad. It's been out for about a year. He has been all over the place doing all kinds of interviews, writing all kinds of articles. So check out leoholman.com, his brand new website. Leo, we've been talking about this for a long time. Your great book is very informative for people, telling them what is happening. People don't, or just finally now, it seems, starting to realize what's going on. Uh, hopefully more people wake up before it uh, gets too late for that. Uh, one of the other uh, factors that is in all of this is it's not like we're just trying to get America to wake up, but we have this other opposition. We have the political Islamists. We have CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, who is um, a uh, Muslim Brotherhood front, gr front group, uh, basically uh, Hamas in the US, yet they have offices throughout the country, even though they've been called a terrorist organization by who? Uh, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and yet they have offices throughout the US, and they are also a huge factor in this because they're trying to give us this watered down, sugar coated Walt Disney version of Islam that doesn't line up with the life of Muhammad. It doesn't line up with the primary sources. And they're always telling you, oh, jihad, yeah, that's like an inward struggle, like your best life now kind of thing. Um, <laughs> it, you know, uh, it's this greater jihad of being an inward struggle was talked about uh, in the primary sources, but it is not what we primarily see. We see an outward fighting that type of jihad. Nevertheless, you also inform your audience all the time, trying to get people to realize, hey, there's a civilization jihad, and that is one of the types of jihad that is happening in the West. Please explain that to our audience. Yeah, uh, civilization jihad is a uh, much more subtle process, and it basically is a form of political warfare on a on a non-Muslim country. Uh, you know, Tony, our country is very good at fighting uh, jihadists overseas. Uh, if if given the ability to fight and 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 not uh, having not being under any you know unfair restraints they can win just about any war against jihadists in any country whether it be you know iraq afghanistan uh you know any place you send our military they're able to smoke these guys out and uh win the day but when it comes to civilization jihad and fighting in the war of ideas this is where Unfortunately, we have not moved the dial, I don't think, even an inch since 9-11. In fact, we may have even uh, gone backwards a little bit uh, since that day, that, uh, that horrible day when President George W. Bush said that Islam was a religion of peace and had nothing to do with the uh, terrorist attack that we saw so devastating on our country. Uh, and it's just gotten worse ever since, um, you know, this, this Bridges meeting I was talking about, the woman that they brought in, uh, her name is Bushra Alloway, and she's a former Army National Guard reservist. And uh, when she got out of the Guard, she's a young woman. Um, I think she's a convert to Islam. Uh, so she speaks, you know, does, doesn't have an accent, a Middle Eastern accent or anything like that. She does wear the hijab. And she now... Uh, has been hired by the FBI to go around talking about Islam to state and local law enforcement officers, educating them about Islam. And she gives exactly what you said, this watered-down, pie-in-the-sky version that doesn't exist in 
any Muslim majority country that I can think of, uh, even the most moderate ones, uh, do not resemble the Islam that Bushra Alloway was describing to these law enforcement officers a couple of weeks at this Bridges meeting. She said that jihad is the inward struggle. For her, her personal jihad, she said, was to not eat too much cheesecake, if you can believe that. Uh, she said that uh, the term Allahu Akbar is nothing to be concerned about. Uh, of course, that means Allah is greatest. Uh, often misinterpreted as God is great by the mainstream media and, and the care folks. Uh, but it really means Allah is greatest. And, and we can get into that if you want to a little bit, just the difference between Allah and, and our God. I don't personally think it's the same God. But uh, that's what the whole reason for that subtle misinterpretation there, saying God is greatest. In other words, you Christians can agree to that, right? Uh you Jews can agree to that. Um, but this is what she was saying, and that Allahu Akbar has nothing to do with terrorism. It, it's said 85 times a day by your average Muslim. Nothing to be concerned about. Move along. Nothing to see here, she was telling the law enforcement officers. Um, it's just, uh, re this is what, this is classic civilization jihad. Uh, watering down the truth, establishing Islam, as the, uh, uh, the top religion in the land, the most respected, most feared, perhaps, if not respected. Um, and and we, that's why we see it, so many media types afraid to speak out any truth, no matter how factual, about uh, Islamic terror or Islamic uh, honor violence or female genital mutilation. Uh, all these things are going on in our country now, and, and you can find local reports on them, you know, female genital mutilation case going on in Michigan. Uh, there's been honor violence, there's been honor killings in Michigan, in Ohio, in Arizona, all within the last few years. The, these are things that never showed up in America before. They are here now. Uh, there's 513,000 girls and young women at risk of having their female genitals mutilated. Uh, it's just disgusting. These are things we didn't have to worry about before, but because we have so many Islamic migrants who've come to the United States over the last 20, 30 years, we're now having to worry about these things. But you can't criticize it. You can't speak out against it, or you're an Islamophobe. And this is a big part of the civilization jihad, Tony, is uh, repressing the truth about Islam and then anyone who, who violates that, uh, what is really a blasphemy law, if you mm -hmm. violate the blasphemy law and speak out critically about Islam, then you're an Islamophobe and you can lose your career, you can lose your job, you can lose your reputation. Uh, in Islamic countries, you can lose your head. Uh, we're not mm -hmm. quite there yet. But we are moving, in, I guess, in that direction because a lot of people who speak out critically about Islam uh, have to worry about losing their job or have to be worry about losing their friends or even their family. Uh, this is going on. And, and in Europe, it's taken to the uh, next step already. Europe and Canada, not all of Europe, but countries like Germany, Sweden, uh, the U.K., uh, France, they all have hate speech laws where you can be fined or imprisoned for putting something on social media that's critical of Islam. Okay, so uh, this is coming, this is the next step that they want to bring here to the United States. A hate law, hate crimes law, uh, not just where it won't be just a hate crime, which we normally associate that with a violent act. Nobody's for that. Uh, none of us for, are for that. But a hate yeah. speech law, hate crimes law, more, tend to morph into hate speech laws. And before you know it, you can be jailed or fined for simply saying something that is considered Islamophobic. And at that point, I think it's over. That's why I think it's over for uh, many of these Western European countries, because they have now given up their freedom of speech. Uh, and that is to nothing but submitting to Islam. And this They're is exactly what we're seeing. Minds. Definitely. And this is what we're seeing up in Canada. You know, I said, other people said, hey, this M103 thing, this is very dangerous. 
trying to tell people, hey, don't pass this thing, they pass it. And then what? less than a month later, we see a news story, oh, now it's uh, moving towards uh, prosecution. It's like, dude, this is like an obvious slippery slope that's going to go on here. And right. whenever anyone obeys this command of, oh, don't offend anyone, well, uh, don't criticize Islam, Muhammad, the Quran, all you're doing is implementing aspects of Sharia upon yourself. Because as you said, right. if you live under Sharia, these exact same rules are going to be in place anyway. And we have people who are just sugarcoating everything. We have Linda Sarsour talking about my jihad. I mean, oh, and I didn't mean anything violence there. I mean, this is so ridiculous. I put online, hey, look, uh, yeah, yeah, don't worry. Uh, there, there's no problem here. My jihad simply means my struggle. In other words, mein Kampf. And uh, that's never been a problem for anyone. Uh, anyway, uh, another thing that, that we uh, or see here is this whole the, the, the claim of a same God. Uh, the most ridiculous one is the three Abrahamic faiths. Uh, this is right. ridiculous because whereas Jews and Christians would agree on exactly who Abraham was, he actually existed in history. This isn't the case with the uh, Islamic Abraham. It's completely different, non-historic Abraham. They aren't the three Abrahamic faiths. They're the three monotheistic faiths at the most. But it's a completely different Abraham revisionist history. And when you bring, up, bring this up, you're called names. Uh, like you said, Islamophobe, bigot, uh, intolerant, all this other stuff. Um, if they want to call names, we can just call them is, uh, Islamophiles. You know, I mean, why are they practicing Islamophilia? Uh, we just need to we just need to stop the name calling and say, look, this is what Islam is according to Muhammad. I don't care what Christianity is compared to anyone other than Jesus. So why are we playing games here when it comes to what Islam is? That is what people need to know about. Uh, what are your thoughts on this whole Abrahamic faith, same God thing? Uh, I think it is a very underhanded, uh, disingenuous move by the Islamic uh, leaders. I don't want to say the Islamic community, because like we said earlier, all Muslims don't buy into this. But uh, they don't have a voice. The, the good Muslims, you know, who, like you said, just want to, to live out their lives in peace and freedom in this country, they don't have a voice. Uh, the only voice of the Islamic community uh, in this country is the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated organizations and they are radical they are revolutionary and they are seditious uh, and that is why uh, they should be banned like they are in these other countries uh, but what I think is going on here Tony is, is uh, it's a very sneaky way by these Muslim Brotherhood affiliated groups like ISNA Islamic Society of North America and ICNA, Islamic Circle of North America, to rope Christians and Jews into these um, uh, interfaith dialogues. And once they get them into these dialogues, it's like not a level playing field where all sides, if it was a true dialogue, I wouldn't have a problem with it. If all sides were willing to put their cards honestly on the table and say, you know, this is where we differ, you know, we're going to have to agree to disagree in this area. Uh, you know, because we don't go there with you on this. But no, uh, they try to find what they call bridges or common ground, a common word it's often called, uh, mm -hmm. when in fact these religions have nothing in common. Uh, the pillar of Christianity, as you said, is Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and the Muslims will come to these meetings and say, oh, we believe in Jesus too. Uh, see, we're not, we're not so bad. We, have, we hold him in the highest esteem and reverence. Uh, but then when you really start asking them the tough questions, you find out that Jesus uh, to the Islamic, in, under the Islamic faith is not the son of God. Uh, he did not die on a cross. I mean, even Jews believe that there was a historical figure named Jesus. They, they may not believe he was the son of God, but they at least believe that he did uh, die on a cross. Uh, this is a historic fact and not acknowledged by historians, even secular historians, believe in the historic Jesus who died on a cross, was put to death on a cross by the Romans. Uh, Muslims don't believe that. They believe he that that somebody else went up on the cross and and faked it in in Jesus's stead and claimed to be Jesus. Jesus never died on the cross. Uh, that's just a big uh, misnomer that we somehow uh, got wrong over the years. 
It's really unbelievable. So Jesus is not the Son of God. He was not crucified. He does not have the power to forgive sin. Uh, God, our God, the Father, is not a father. He never had a son, so how can he be a father? Uh, you know, he's this impersonal uh, God who's just out there, who willy-nilly judges people, and uh, you cannot ever uh, have any assurance of salvation. Uh, there really is no mode of salvation in under Islam. It's just up to the whim of Allah, and uh, he's completely unlike our God. And so uh, I believe that the bottom line uh, effort of these interfaith dialogues is to weaken the resolve and weaken the faith of the Christian leaders in these communities where they're uh, going, these, these dialogues are going on. And ultimately, Tony, I think that uh, if these Christians aren't careful, the ultimate agenda will be to get them to actually deny Christ, deny the deity of Christ. And I've reported a number of stories, ridiculous stories, about you know Christian pastor uh, admits to personally worshiping a, a law and this kind of stuff, and just turning over his church to become a mosque and that kind of stuff. Um, there's so many factors that 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 fall into this. I mean, this whole interfaith dialogue thing, uh, we never see a a solid orthodox Christian <laughs> as part of these uh, dialogues. We see usually right. like a Unitarian Universalist uh, Christian. Uh, and then we see like a liberal Jew, and then we see a Muslim who actually knows what they're talking about. And it's more of like a, hey, let's agree that Islam is the greatest thing since sliced bread kind of talk. It's never a debate. No, We don't have problems with debates or any of that stuff. Right. But the thing is, too, is that no one ever asks, uh, who was Jesus? Because if a Muslim knows their theology, they're going to say, well, he was a Muslim. That does not, right. not line up with history. This is completely revisionist for any of our viewers who don't know what that means. Uh, Islamic history is completely make-believe. It, it is made up. It does not line up with any history outside of itself. If you look to um, Roman history, Jewish history, uh, any other historical source, nothing lines up with the Islamic worldview. So people need to start asking questions. What do you mean by this? Who is this person according to Islam? Who is Jesus according to Islam? Who is Allah? Who is just God in general, using that term. We need to define our terms. If we don't, we continue to talk past one another. Now, this question here seems like it's completely off the topic, but it's not. Leo, can you discuss for a moment the role of the meatpacking industry in the process of Islamization? Haha, <laughs> very interesting, uh, seemingly off topic question that really uh, is part of the overarching overall equation here, if we're going to be talking about the Islamization of uh, America and its uh, cities and towns. Um, I started investigating this sort of, uh, you know, from the top down and, you know, uh, first started looking at the major cities and uh, you tend to see uh, a lot of uh, Islamic migration into the major cities uh, because you have, what, universities there which are have all been globalized. They, they believe in creating global citizenry and they're very anti-American. Uh, most of our uh, publicly funded universities. So it fits their agenda to bring in a lot of international students, uh, in many cases to the detriment of American students uh, who, who don't get into the enrollment uh, in the place of many of these international students, which can afford to pay the full um, uh, tuition as opposed to many American students who need financial aid. So it's more profitable as well for the universities to bring in Islamic and, and foreign students. Uh, but, but if you start looking out from there, uh, as I have in the last year and a half, you find that uh, it's not just these major cities who are bringing in the Islamic uh, students, the Islamic refugees, the Islamic workers. Uh, it is now happening in small town America, uh, the heartland, uh, especially in the Midwest, like throughout Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Illinois, Tennessee, uh, even down into Georgia and North Carolina. And, and the impetus for this, Tony, uh, is an unsuspected villain. 
the private industry and in in mo many cases the private meat packing industry uh, you have companies like Tyson Foods JBS Swift Cargill uh, these uh, national beef these are the mega global meat packing corporations who uh, in many cases are foreign owned. In the case of JBS Swift, the world's largest meat packer, they're based in Brazil. So you have foreign owned companies uh, hiring more and more foreign workers. Uh, in the 1990s, it was mostly Latin American illegals. Uh, but under the presidency of George W. Bush, the federal government started raiding these meat packing plants in Minnesota and around the Midwest and made an example out of several of them, sent some people to jail for, uh, and made them pay big fines for hiring illegal Latin American labor. And so what the meat packing industry did was they, uh, they started looking at other sources of cheap labor and they said, well, if that's illegal and it's going to cost us, uh, because they'd already replaced many of their American workers by this point in the, around the mid nineties, you know, uh, many of these American jobs were going to these illegals and, and they were being paid, you know, in sometimes in some cases, half of what the American workers were being paid. Meatpacking used to be a, a solid middle-class job that would pay $17, $18, $19 dollars an hour or more. Well, the average now for a meatpacking job is right around $10 or $11 dollars an hour. And so almost uh, half is what's being paid. But after these raids occurred uh, under the Bush administration, the executives started looking at other alternatives. And what they found was that the refugee resettlement program was the uh, hen that laid the golden egg, uh, so to speak. No pun intended, as many of them are chicken meat packing plants, as well as beef and pork. Uh, but uh, they have uh, now many of these plants hire up to 10% uh, of their workforce is refugee labor. And it's not just meat packing, it's also uh, food processing in general. The uh, Chobani, Chobani yogurt plant in Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, you know, talk about an all American city there. Twin Falls, Idaho has the world's largest yogurt plant. It's oper owned and operated by Chobani, and 30% uh, of its workforce is refugee labor. 30%. Uh, and so uh, this is leading to the rapid Islamization of many of these smaller cities and towns. I mean, to give an extreme case, Knoll, Missouri. This was a town of a thousand people, very small. It, it, it was sort of a tourist town. People would go there for kayaking and, and they have the uh, river goes through there. I believe it's the Missouri River. And um, and, and that was a big tourist industry there. And it was a beautiful little small town. And well, over the last 10 years, Tyson Foods has started uh, importing cheap refugee labor, mostly Somalis from Somalia. And uh, the town has uh, gone from 1,000 population to 1,800, you know, almost 100% increase in its population. And it's all Somali and, and East African. And so this has gone from an all-American town to something that resembles a third-world hellhole in many cases. And so uh, uh, in a small town like that, uh, you know, you can flip it. You can flip it from an all-American town to a third-world country, uh, something resembling a third-world country, in about five or ten years. It really doesn't take that long. And uh, this is what we're seeing happening in town after town. St. Cloud, Minnesota is now 15%. Uh, East African, Somali, mostly Muslim. Uh, that's a town of 65 or 70,000 people. Lexington, uh, Nebraska, uh, not Lex, yes, Lexington, Nebraska, uh, Wilmar, Minnesota. Uh, the list goes on. One small town after another is being Islamized. Leo, there are multiple factors here. You figure, if nothing else, can America handle? the influx of thousands and thousands of people, giving them free everything. Number two, who are these people going to vote for? Oh, whoever decides yeah. to give them or promises them the most continued free stuff. And number three, 
they're coming from countries uh, with a Islamic worldview for the most part. They are part of the Ummah uh, uh, as the, the worldwide Muslim community. This is how the, the Islamists and the jihadists see it as. And th all of these factors fall into this. Uh, this is why people need to know about what's going on. They need to get your book, Stealth Invasion. Again, get Leo's book, read it, tell other people to get it. Leo has a bunch of information he's compiled. All the stuff that we talked about in this show, there's there's way more info that you still need to know about. And you can find all of it there. Uh, Leo, in 30 seconds, what is needed other than more Americans speaking out about this to reverse this trend toward Islamization of the West, specifically the United States? Yeah, good question, Tony. Uh, on the negative side, we need to stop some things. Uh, we need to stop the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and, and in order to do that, we need our administration, the Trump administration, to declare it a, a terrorist organization. Uh, Congress doesn't have the uh, the guts to do this. There's been bills introduced for the last several years, and they can never get one passed. The administration has the power to do this on its own, and it needs to do that. The second thing is it needs to uh, uh, continue uh, to – it needs to not just cut back on the numbers of refugees coming from these countries. It needs to reform the laws because what's going to happen is if, if, if we just – cut the numbers coming in but don't change the laws, as soon as the Democratic Party comes back into the White House, they're going to ramp it back up even more than ever and make up for lost time. So we need to get uh, change the law so that these contractors that we talked about earlier are not getting paid on a per head basis and they're not allowed to lobby for a program that they're personally benefiting, benefiting from financially. The, on the positive side, we need to, as Americans, realize we have something worth fighting for, something worth protecting, and that is our Christian faith. Uh, the, the Muslims feel that way about their faith. They're very dedicated. But the reason that they're allowed to do the things, become super citizens and get special rights and privileges is because we apparently don't see our faith as anything worth preserving or defending in this country. We do come from a Christian heritage in our country, and we need to start valuing that and respecting that in our own personal lives and, 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 and sharing it with the Muslims in a loving way. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Bridges program that I want to point my viewers to is by uh, Fouad Masri over at Crescent Project, because his Bridges program uh, better yes. equips you to reach out to your Muslim neighbors and friends and coworkers, share the gospel with them, give them New Testaments. Because, Leo, if the worldview can actually be changed, uh, the, the worldview that these people hold can be changed, can be uh, regenerated, regenerated uh, heart, renewed mind, because they've realized who Jesus truly is— and they repent and put their trust in him, well then, that's pretty much equivalent to thousands and thousands of Christians coming here if all of a sudden their worldview changes. And this is what we want to leave our viewers with. Yes, there is a problem here. There's a problem of Islamization, but at the same time, you, you need to be educated, but still, at the same time, don't let this keep you from loving your Muslim uh, coworker, or again, friend, neighbor, whatever. They need Absolutely. the gospel. Be Christ-like towards them. Share the good news with them. But know at the same time, as Ronald Reagan said, hey, um, we are no more than, than one generation uh, away from losing our freedom. I'm ad-libbing there. That's not exactly what he said, but pretty much. I mean, every single generation is in charge of keeping that freedom and passing it on to the next generation, to your children and grandchildren. And Leo, we thank God for you and the work that you're doing. I hope that all of our viewers pick up your book. They check out your website. They read your constant articles that you put out follow you on Twitter, Facebook, wherever else. Thank you so much for being on the show once again. And we should probably just go ahead and book you for a year from now to get that third year <laughs> update, probably. So, Let's so, not thank wait you so much that for being long. On. <laughs> thank Let's you so much, Leo. Let's not wait that long, Tony. Uh, I'd love to come back uh, in, in, in less than a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we'll have to do every six month thing. We'll, we'll talk and we'll figure it out. But uh, we just want to point people Absolutely. to your book because that, that information is definitely important. People need to get that. So thank you so much for being on again. Again, thank this is Stealth so Invasion. Much, to get this book, friends, and pass this on to other people as well. This is an entire book on this topic. 
that you're not getting from the mainstream media. So this book falls right in line with what you find every week on Islam in the News, every single Friday, your Islamic news source that you need to be tuning in for, but also colliding worldviews here every single Monday. Thanks for joining us and stay tuned to the training channel for all of the weekly shows as you've seen and heard about all the news, all the weekly shows that we have. And again, tell other people about the Trinity channel as well and subscribe to the YouTube channel. You'll be able to get all of the notices about the new videos that are posted there every single week. God bless you. Reach out and love your Muslim neighbor enough to share the gospel with them. And we will see you next Monday for another episode of Colliding Worldviews.